Good morning, and a very warm, warm welcome to the first day of the Scottish Land Commission and Agricultural Law Association's mock mediation, mediation in the tenant farming sector. My name is John Robertson, and it's my pleasure to chair this event. You will hopefully all have received uh, the delegate pack and have been able to watch the pre-webinar uh, briefing, and shortly we'll start the mediation proper. Before we begin, a few housekeeping points. Firstly, in true Hollywood style, please bear in mind that all names, characters, businesses, places, events, and incidents in the mock mediation you're about to see are entirely fictitious, and the views expressed do not necessarily uh, represent the views of the participants, nor of the Scottish Land Commission uh, or the Agricultural Law Association. We will run a few polls during the two webinars, and the first one is on your screens now. A nice straightforward one to start with, uh, not to test you too early in the day. Uh, have you been involved in a mediation before? So if you'd like to put your answers into that, uh, we'll come back with the um, results shortly. The mediation recording you're about to hear will be interspersed with live commentary from Robin Burley, and we're going to end the session this morning with a question and answer session. If you do have any questions at any time during the day, uh, please use the Q&A functions on your screen and we'll do our best to get around to the questions uh, at the end of the day. In the meantime, the results of that poll you've just done, only about 30% have been involved in a mediation before. So a treat is in store for 71% of the uh, delegates. So I'm now going to hand you over to Robin Burley, who will provide the introduction to the mock mediation. Robin. Good morning and welcome to the Pitlocky Farm dispute. Our intention by showing a mock mediation, and indeed our goal throughout the seminar, is to shed light on the process of mediation and the techniques of mediators. As mediators, we know that the more participants in mediation understand the craft of mediating, the more effective their participation is and the better and more creative the outcomes. But if you are involved in mediation in the future, don't expect it to follow in detail what happens here. The clue is in the word mock, which in the sense of this event is an imitation, but an imitation in the specific way of enabling us to learn by testing and demonstrating approaches and methods. I hope you may have found time to watch the introductory video to this webinar, which provides background information on mediation in the tenant farming sector, the legal context, and the place of mediation in the field of dispute resolution. We also included a video of a meeting in which the parties and the mediators are preparing for mediation. We will now, in a series of six videos, show you our mock mediation. But first, let me introduce the Pitlocky players and the dispute, for which we are grateful to Jamie Whittle of R&R Urquhart for penning the narrative and the ca characters of this fictitious dispute. Most of you will already have met the Pitlocky players. We have a tenant side, a landlord side, and the mediators. The landlord, Sean Bellway, is played by David Johnston, and the tenant farmer, George Smith, is played by Christopher Nicholson. The other characters and events portrayed in this mock event are fictitious, including the players, Heather Bruce and Hamish Lean, lawyers, Mark Fogden and Tom Oates, land agents, and Pamela Lyle and Lindsay Burley, co-mediators, and they'll all be playing their fictitious selves. The Pitlocky story goes that the farmer, George Smith, took over Pitlocky from his father, and he hopes his daughter, Megan, will become the farmer on his retirement. However, the landlord, Sean Bellway, issued a notice to end the partnership next year which will effectively bring George Smith's hopes of three generations farming Pitlocky to what he sees as a premature end. It is not surprising that this background and the 
interests of Sean Belway and George Smith are now set on a collision course, which may end up in the land court. But on the recommendations of their advisors, our two principals have agreed to see if they can resolve their differences by mediation. Most mediators like to meet each party separately in their own rooms before bringing them together in the joint room where the opening statements will be made. In the private sessions at this stage, the mediators are continuing the preparations which started in that pre-mediation meeting you saw in the video. These meetings are not so much about the positions or interests of the parties, but more about their preparations, how they've gone since the pre-mediation session. It is also about answering any questions they may have. And generally, it is an opportunity to discuss, discuss things that the parties may have on their minds before meeting in joint session. Apart from checking in with the parties in those ways, what mediators will want to establish in the meeting is that the agreement to mediate is in order and how they will make their opening statements. In the course of this meeting, the mediators may mention some of the ground rules of mediation. In our first video today, we join the landlord team being greeted by Pamela Lyle in their own room. And that meeting will be followed by one in the tenants team's room where Lindsay Burley starts the session. So we've got Sean here, thank you. And we've got Mark and we've got Heather as well. That's great. Sean, your father, Vincent, and your wife, Sue, have also signed the agreement to mediate as well as yourself. Is that right? That is correct, yes. That's grand, that's grand. And that's really about the confidentiality side of things. It's not so much about, because you're representing um, the, the Gateside Land Improvement Company Limited. That's exactly right. Behalf. Okay. So can I just say, to begin with, that this is a confidential discussion that we're going to have. Everything that you say to Lindsay and I will be confidential. It's not going to, we're not going to share it with anybody else. Um, so I would encourage you to be as candid as you can be with us, which I know might be quite difficult um, because people like to play their cards quite close to their chest, but I would encourage you to be as open as you can be with us. Okay. So first of all, could I, could I just ask, um, I'm just going to ask Sean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, you've made an offer to, um, to George. Is that right? We have made an offer to George. That's, that, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. And that, do you, do you know that that has been rejected by George? Oh, it was Heather here. Yes, uh, Hamish, Lean and myself attempted to negotiate something between you, just between solicitors. Right. But unfortunately, we're quite some, some way apart and my client's right. very disappointed about that. But there's also um, the, the personal aspects within us, myself and my family, um, the, the need to get home um, to be beside my father who is unwell um, but also bring the family back up to Scotland and base them in Scotland um, and we don't have a huge number of options with regards to where that could be based uh, and we were looking at that farmhouse as, as, as to be our family home so there is a, an emotional side of it from us as well and it, yeah. that, I, I appreciate that makes it tricky. Yeah. Well, emotion is often at play in a mediation. I mean, people quite often say it's just, it's, it, it's not emotional, it's just about, it's just cut and dried. And actually, it usually is emotional. There's usually some level of emotion involved in it. So Sean, you were saying also that you were sorry that you hadn't spoken with George before serving notice. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I was yeah. not aware of, of the, or fully aware of, of the code that came out of the, the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Right. And, the and is, that, is that an apology you'd like to give to George at some point during the day? Yeah, I think we already have done in correspondence, but quite happy to do so as well. Absolutely. Okay. And Heather, can I ask you, who, who's going to speak uh, as we all get together? Because you've all agreed that you're going to get together at the outset. Who's going to speak, Heather? I, I, think, we, I think we agreed um, that Heather would be speaking for, yep. um, for us. Anybody else, Mark? I think Heather's frozen. The question. I think she's frozen. Yes. Pamela, I think the question was whether I would make a short introduction and then then hand across to. Well, that might be quite helpful. We've probably, we've probably covered most things, though, Pamela. So yeah. we'll let Heather perhaps just sort out the technical yeah. side of things. Um, so what um, we're going to do now is is um, would it be would it be all right for you to speak first, Sean, 
because yeah. you are the landlord and you've served notice. So I think that's probably technically correct that you speak first, if that's all right. Happy to do so. Um, that's grand. Um, so we will say, we will um, we'll finish this conversation and we'll go to the tenants room now. So um, you're not going to be saying anything, Mark, but I think that might be quite helpful for you to just to listen in and to hear what they've got to say. It might, be that it might be that you need to meet with Tom at some point to have a further conversation in the presence of Lindsay and myself, if that's all right. That's yeah, fine. First of all, thank you very much for signing the agreement to mediate. And I note in that, George, that, that um, your daughter, Megan, um, has, uh, has signed that. But um, when we go into the meeting with, uh, with Sean and, um, and Heather and uh, Mark, um, what there'll be the opportunity to do there is to um, really say what um, what the issues are for you. Now, we were going to suggest, um, as long as it's uh, you agree with this, George, that perhaps um, Sean should speak first, should go first. He was the one that actually raised the, the matter in the first place. Um, and that while he, and I think it's going to be Heather as well, are speaking, that you three of you, and, and Pamela and myself, we really just listen to the points that are being made. There'll be plenty of opportunity to pick up on, on issues um, after we've had the opening statements. Um, but I think it's important not to, um, not to interrupt th those. And then there'll be the opportunity for yourselves to say what, what it is about this matter that really is important to you and what you would like to get out of the mediation. Um, and, and perhaps important to say, you, you will hear things, I'm sure, from Sean and from Heather that you may just want to respond to, and that's fine, but this is not necessarily you responding to them. It's about you saying what's really important to, to you. And again, that'll be an opportunity for you to say that uninterrupted by any, anyone else. So the question I've got, first of all, is, um, which, George, you'll have talked about this, I'm sure, with Hamish and, and Tom. How do you want to play that opportunity, that, uh, that opening um, in, in the joint session? S setting out our position and what, we, what I would want out of it. Mm. Yeah, I'm happy to do that unless it's more conventional for a professional agent to do it. <laughs> to be honest, there aren't conventions. It's what you feel, and particularly the three of you feel, is is most appropriate um, and I don't know Hamish may well want to to say something here what do you think Hamish? I think at this stage it's quite important for George to to set out what he wants to achieve in the mediation and, and, and how he feels about the process I might want to say something depending on what the landlord solicitor says yes Yes, and I think Hamish used an important word there, and that's about what you feel about this. Um, th this, this is clearly a very, um, you know, cent central issue to your, your life and, and to Megan's life. So it's, it is about what's important to you. Um, but not to exclude Tom from this discussion, because I'm, I, I know, I understand, maybe I don't know, I understand that you and Mark have had some... Um, uh, some discussions, uh, particularly about the um, the inventory, uh, but there'll be um, clearly opportunities for you and, and he to to discuss matters as well. Tom, do you want to say anything at this point? Yeah, I think that's that's a fair comment. Um, I yes, Mark and I have had some brief discussions about things, um, and I think we've got a bit of consensus, obviously subject to client's approval, about how we can move forward on a number of items. Um, and George, are you are you happy that we that we get together with Sean? Anything yeah. else you want to? Yeah. What, what I'm expecting, what I'm exp I'm happy for that, and I'm expecting to hear from them their their position and yes. uh, start from them, and and we set out. I set out my position and my hopes. Yes. Yes. Well, I think at that stage, let's let's move back into um, into session together. And um, Pamela and I will be saying just a few words right at the beginning, but then we'll get, uh, we'll get going. Thank you. 
As we move away from the opening sessions with each party, it is a good point for me to come in and describe a framework which I hope will assist you to follow the mock mediation game plan. It is a way that you can visualize where things are in the process. This visualization I'm using is in the shape of a diamond with horizontal slices to represent different stages in the process and to an extent stages in time and time spent in the meeting. To describe the stages, I'm using the acronym POUND, which gives you the initial letter of a word for each stage, preparing, opening, understanding, negotiating, deciding. As we move to each stage in the mock mediation, I will say a little more about it before that part in the video. But don't regard this as a rigid structure. It is more like a flow diagram with feedback loops and sometimes diversions with what may seem like roadblocks on the way along the track. Preparing through the pre-mediation meeting video and the private sessions you've just viewed, we have completed the preparing stage and we're now moving into the opening stage. In this opening stage, you will find the mediators and the parties in the joint room. And there are three openings. The mediators set the scene for the mediation by making opening remarks. And you will see that Pamela and Lindsay do this in two different points in the joint meeting. This is to avoid an overlong monologue at the beginning. Each party also makes an opening, which is un uninterrupted time for them and their advisors to outline their views, which might give some background to the dispute, some information on the current situation, and some views about how each party would like to use the opportunity of mediation to resolve matters. The openings are followed by exploration of any relevant matters, including how to take the discussions forward. We will now join the mediators, parties, and advisors in the joint room as Pamela welcomes everyone to the joint opening session. Hi there, everybody. So we're all together now in the main session. Um, can I just say this is a confidential discussion we're going to have. Everything that is said at the moment, as I was saying in the pre-mediation meeting that we had, is confidential. And I think that's really important that you bear that in mind. Um, I'm going to ask Sean to speak first and then Heather to speak. Um, but I would like to say a few things before, before we actually start the, that, that conversation. Um, this is a voluntary process, and I think that's really important that you all understand that. I'm sure you do understand that. It means that if, if anybody wants to leave at any time, then you're very free to do that. But could you tell Lindsay and I that you'd like to go? Because we may want to have a conversation with you before you leave. And authority is something else I want to just mention very briefly. Um, I know that, um, Sean, your father and your wife have signed the agreement to mediate. And also, uh, George, your daughter, Megan, has signed the agreement to mediate. So that, that, that's really helpful. OK, mm -hmm. so I'm going to turn now to Sean and ask you to speak first of all, Sean. And then Heather's going to come in with a legal framework, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's helpful. OK, Sean, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say a few words to set sort of my position, the landlord's position out. Uh, I appreciate this is a really difficult uh, situation. It's very hard to be doing it electronically rather than face to face. Um, but we are living in the world that we are living in. Uh, to George, uh, I'd like to apologise for the notice being sent out ahead of uh, conversations being had with yourself and your daughter, which I understand now um, does not comply with the uh, tenant farming commissioner's code. Um, that was never the intention. There was a lot going on and I didn't fully appreciate and understand it or, or take on the advice that had been given. So my apologies um, for that. Um, what I'd also like to say something from a personal point of view is that um, it's also a tough time for my own family in the sense that my father is unwell um, and we are trying to move back up north from London to Scotland to, to create the family home and move up here on a permanent basis. Um, we are seeking to find that family home and also to fulfill other um, ambitions from working on, on, on the family land uh, back up here in, in Scotland. So we are looking forward to working with this process for the mediation. I understand my father 
uh, undertook mediation in 2009, which was successful. Mm. So um, I look forward to hoping come together with a, with a mutually acceptable way forward. So thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to turn now to Heather. What would you like to say, Heather, and speak to everybody? Yes, thank you very much. I'm just going to set out um, a little bit about the legal offers which have already been made for each side, um, just to summarise them and summarise um, our starting point. Um, and as my client said, he hopes to be able to reach some sort of mutually acceptable um, agreement today. Um, so the landlord had offered a five-year short limited duration tenancy um, on two conditions really, one on the farmhouse coming back in May 2021 um, and secondly ruling the agreed improvements um, to the end of that five-year lease. Um, I understand from Hamish Lean that that is not acceptable to, to George Smith. Um, Hamish has responded with a counter offer um, to a 35 year fixed term lease jointly in favour of George and Megan and the survivor of them. And all of the items on a list which has been exchanged between the agents um, being accepted as tenants improvements. Um, the, the two land agents have had quite productive discussions behind the scenes in advance of this mediation and I, I, I'll let them say more about that but I think there's a number of items that are agreed but there are a few that are not so that needs some further fleshing out um, and clearly at the moment the uh, lease duration that's been offered on behalf of the landlord has, is not acceptable to the tenant but it would be helpful for us to understand why not given that the, the legal fallback would be a three-year continuation of the existing lease. And even if we were to start again with the Tenant Farming Commissioner notice, um, which is not a legal requirement, it, but even if we were to take it as such, it would be a four-year continuation. So in a way, five years, or not in a way, five years is better than either of those two <laughs> options. So it would be helpful for us to understand um, why that's not acceptable. Um, and whether there's anything else that could be suggested um, to sort this out. Finally, I just wanted to mention off the back of what you've said, Pamela, about confidentiality. Yeah. Um, there's been a number of um, rather difficult um, online comments um, made. I understand not actually by, by George or his family, but perhaps by those that think they are supporting George and his family, which have been very unkind and, and very upsetting for my client and his family at a time when his father is very seriously unwell. And so it's very important that today's um, outcome, if we get there, um, is kept confidential, but perhaps that something's put out into the press to just to acknowledge that it has resolved and hopefully put an end to that rather unpleasant online attention. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Um, I mean, you can agree how you're going to deal with confidentiality. That, that, that's not a problem for, our, for Lindsay and myself. We, we start with the default that everything is confidential. If you want to agree something between yourselves that there's then going to be fed into the newspapers or whoever, then that's fine as far as we're concerned. But um, the default is that everything is confidential until you agree otherwise. I'm going to turn to Lindsay now and ask you, Lindsay, to pick up with George and Hamish, if that's all right. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pamela. Um, and thank you both uh, Sean and, and Heather for, for, for what you've just said as well. I just wanted to pick up a couple of points before handing over to, to George. I think George is going to speak uh, first. Um, and just to um, recognise something about the... Um, the agreement side of this, you've all signed the um, agreement to mediate and thank you very much for that, but also to recognize that um, at the end of, of this mediation, we hope, Pam Pamela and I both hope that you will reach a settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, until that point, um, whatever gets said, offers or counter offers or whatever, they're not binding. Um, it's very important that, um, that people feel free to think about 
how um, you might resolve this um, in, a, in a fairly creative way. So nothing is, is, uh, is settled until we do get to a, um, a legally binding settlement agreement. And the other thing to say, and I know we, um, we talked about this when we met in the pre-mediation um, meeting, is, is the role that Pamela and I have. We're, we're really here to, to help you um, come to an agreement. We're not here to adjudicate in any way. And we are um, impartial. I think Pamela at the, at the meeting said we're multi-partial. So with those few words, um, can I pass over to, to George? Thank, thank you, Lindsay. And I hear what Sean has said, and I'm pleased that um, Sean and his advisors are, are here um, looking for an opportunity for both, the, both of us to um, try and attempt to reach a, a mutually acceptable agreement. Um, I'm, I'm obviously the tenant farmer here at, at the moment. Um, my family and Sean's family have a sort of multi-generation -gener history of, of um, far farming here on this farm and I would hope that it, it can continue. Um, my aim is really to try and um, some, somehow remain um, an actively farming on this holding whether that be through through um a new lease or other other arrangements from um contract farming arrangements or farm management agreements um i'm prepared to be quite quite flexible and i'd also like to try and establish what sean's aim is long term in terms of um the future of the farm uh, how, how it might be managed what he seeks to um get uh, what outcomes he seeks from the the, the, the farm in the, in the future. Um, I feel that there's a, a lot of history between good history between the two uh, fa families, and I wouldn't want to see that all all disappear. And I hope that we can come to some form of agreement whereby the two respective families continue to. Um, ensure a, a, a positive management for the for the holding going forward and um you know into the mix comes the the amnesty and and um tenants improvements and how we treat that can all be part of the mix going go, going forward um i'm aware that um sean's family uh and, and i can understand why they they are looking to um, gain access to the to the house. Um, I think there are solutions there that that there are two cottages that that um, my family might be able to occupy. Um, therefore, releasing the the farmhouse. But there's a whole mix there, and I think we should take this opportunity to explore what solution might be the best for both of us going going forward. So that that's really my my position, and. Um, I'm sure Hamish has something else to add in. George, th thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that. Hamish? Just to say that the, the legal position is very well understood by my client, uh, and he and his family have quite a journey to actually get to that position. And George has demonstrated through his opening comments that he is prepared to be extremely pragmatic and very flexible at reaching a, a solution. Um, rather than explain the, the reason why uh, we suggested a 35-year modern limited duration tenancy, I'd like to turn that on its head, really, uh, and explore why it was thought that a five-year short limited duration tenancy with compensation being postponed was thought might be acceptable to the tenant after George's own tenancy uh, of 25 years, albeit be a limited partnership, and then his father's own tenancy before that, uh, when George's father and Sean's father enjoyed a, a very long and successful uh, relationship. Uh, George uh, and his daughter are looking to be able to continue their association at Pitlochie, uh, and they hope that the mediation will be the way to uh, achieve that. Uh, but the legal position, uh, as I say, is very well understood by them. 
Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, and, and George, thank you, and, and thank you, Sean, for um, your opening remarks that really suggest that you're both very keen to come to um, a, a, a satisfactory conclusion in, in this mediation. Um, George, I, I heard you saying that you, you are um, prepared to be flexible and, and that you're keen to understand what Sean's aims are for the, um, uh, for the longer term of the farm. And I particularly picked up that you said there's been a very good history between the families and you want that relationship to continue. And this is often the case. This isn't simply, I was going to say simply, it's not a simple matter of the commercial and the legal issues, but this is about longer term relationships between the, the two of you. Um, and I, I think we've probably come to the point where it would be good to just pull out what the, um, the issues are um, or the topics are that we can start to address um, individually, if you like. So there's, there's issues around the inventory. Um, and I know that Tom and Mark have already done some work about that. Um, there's clearly issues about the, the legal aspects. And, um, and, there's, and as part of that, there's some very important matters around the house as well as the farm, uh, the farmlands as well. Um, so let me just check though that um, Sean and your colleagues, you heard what George said, and then I'll you know, um, turn to George just to see if there's anything you want to just clarify or ask any questions about. I mean, from, from, from Lano's point of view, probably to discuss amongst ourselves, but also just to welcome um, George's comments and, and the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish here. So I think there's, there's good optimism there to, to work through, I think. Yes, yes. George, anything you want to add at this point? Um, I, I think what's in important for me to try and get my head around everything is to have an understanding of what Sean's vision is for the the farm going forward and how it might be managed and, and what he wants to um, gain gain fr fr from the farm um, and that allows me to think of ways in which that might be a, uh, achievable in a in a way that's beneficial to us both. We are moving away from the first video a little before the end of the meeting. We have just heard some mutualizing gestures by the two principals, which is a positive sign and an all important apology from Sir Sean. Off camera, the mediators go on to discuss with the parties what the next steps might be. The mediators make the suggestion that they should now have meetings between the advisors but Sean comes in and suggests that first, he and his advisors should be given some time to meet in private. The flexibility of the mediation process is illustrated by the mediators agreeing to Sean's request and both parties now go off for their private meetings with their advisors. We won't see those private discussions, but we will rejoin the mediation in the advisors' rooms. While much of the last session was the parties setting out their positions, which as you will have seen, are very far apart. Some of it is starting to touch on what matters to them and provides indications of where their best interests lie. For example, Heather explains her client's wish for a media statement as part of any settlement to lessen the damaging online comments from people in the community concerned about what is happening to George and his family. You might also have noted that in relation to this, Pamela explained that confidentiality is not absolute and that where the parties reach an agreement, there is no problem making a public statement. Towards the end, Lindsay uses a frequent mediator move, which is to highlight mutuality of interest in the openings of the parties. She also goes on to identify the main topics, which they will need to address during the next part of the mediation. Lindsay and Pamela, Welcome. Thank you. Hello. I'm very pleased Hi you there. could join me for this uh, short conversation. When we decided to create this mock mediation, 
we went for the co-mediation approach. I think largely because that was the approach we had taken to the SLC pilot scheme mediations. Mm -hmm. But that is only one way that mediators may work. Setting aside for now a mediator working on their own, two mediators, as well as working together as co-mediators, may work as lead and assistant mediator. The difference in these two ways of working is very much a personal choice. But in conversation, I wish to invite you to help us understand the benefits and disbenefits and what factors might influence which approach mediators might adopt. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd like to open by asking Pamela, and it's nice to see you, Pamela. Yeah, and you too. Um, uh, the, the, just to say a bit about how you tend to work. Yeah, which, yeah, which is different from the way that you and, you and Robin work. I tend to work with an assistant working with me, and this is somebody who is uh, qualified as a mediator, but not very experienced. There's no additional cost for having them involved. And they act as really, I mean, there is a speaking part. I do ask them if, to contribute, but it really is I'm the lead and they are assisting me. And it really is in the downtime between, between meetings when, when I would meet with the assistant that I get um, the benefit of their extra eyes and ears because they hear and see things differently from the way I see them, which is, which is helpful. So that, that's the way I would normally work, yeah. Sorry. We're picking up on that, of course, that is one of the benefits of having just two people. The difference with co-mediation is we're both um, experienced mediators yeah. and we're um, able to, um, to, to to bat the ball from one to the other. Yeah, or the that's right. That's right. And you're also able to have meetings in parallel, so that um, which I think is very helpful. Um, so I, I, I do see there's an advantage in having co-mediators as well, but I think you need to know each other quite well and trust each other implicitly because you are working in that kind of environment where yeah. you, would, you are doing things with the other person. Yes, I think that's very important. And I, I think the words, the term co-mediation tends to get used for a rather different yeah. uh, model, which is the model that you've described. I don't yeah. think that is co-mediation. No, it isn't. Uh, the, other, the other thing um, that, that is tremendously valuable, which we don't really have to have an opportunity to see in this mock mediation is the discussions that you have or one has yeah. outside of the, you know, working with the parties and just, um, just picking up, as you as you were saying, picking up the things that you don't um, uh, that you might miss when you're when you're in the the lead. Absolutely, that's the wrong word, but you're taking the chair in the particular session, yeah. and the other person is able to to observe. I have to say, I, I mean, I I either co-mediate usually, or I'm doing them as on a handed mediator. Mm. Uh, but it depends on the mediation. So there's quite a lot of mediations that are short. Um, relatively, I was going to say straightforward, there's nothing straightforward, <laughs> the parties, but, but certainly less complex than these farming ones tend to be. Okay, okay, that's interesting. So uh, that's, uh, so I, uh, Robin, I mean, what, uh, does, yes, that, uh, does that address the, <laughs> the issue? <laughs> <What's sufficient? laughs> yes, I think, I, I, think that, I think that addresses the issue well. Um, I, mean, I think one of the things Pam said, because there'll be people out there thinking about commissioning mediators, most mediators will charge um, for the mediation. Yeah. They will actually differentiate in their charges in the way that they do it. And uh, so I, I suppose that might help to set, set minds at rest about cost. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, no, I mean, co-mediation can be two heads are better than one, but if they don't know each other really well yeah. uh, and they, don't, they haven't got it worked out how they will work together, and yeah. how they will make two plus two equal five, or is it one plus one equals three? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Synergy if, anyway. <laughs> if, if, if they've not got that one worked out, it can actually yeah. uh, be a disadvantage. Yeah. So one has to really know one's partner. Yeah, well. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you. We would now like to run another poll. Uh, we're going to invite you uh, to be a pundit on the outcome of this mediation. The questions come up on your screen. Um, it's what do you think the outcome of the mediation will be? And your answers can be one, no settlement. The tenancy will end in three years. Two, agreement on a five-year SLDT. Three, agreement on an MLDT. Or four, something else. Before we move into the next uh, into the next session with the advisors. I'll pick up on where this fits into my diamond 
of the stages of mediation and say a bit more about how mediators might frame questions. In our flow diagram of the mediation process, we're now moving from the opening stage to the understanding path. And it's not accidental that this is the largest segment in the diagram. In the openings, topics have been identified which the mediators want to follow up on. At this stage, the mediator's questions are likely to be very open of the tell me more type. The idea behind the dialogue is to help develop a better understanding of the issues and the possibilities. As we develop an understanding of the differences in the parties take on the various topics in dispute, there may be a development of possibilities which can lead to enlarging the canvas on which the final decisions and the settlement can be shaped. What we usually find is that the process of understanding is a time for going below the surface of parties' positions with a view to giving them the space for thinking differently and potentially thinking creatively. Amongst the skills of mediators, two of the most important are active listening and asking good questions, both of which are about much more than informing the mediator's understanding. What we hope to achieve is a quality in the listening climate of the room, which enhances everyone's understanding, not just the issues, but understanding of the opportunities. As was illustrated in the Ross and Bain research, which I spoke about in the introductory video, one of the things that parties appreciated about what mediators do is that they ask questions. But why is this so different from the questions asked in an adjudicative process? I suppose we need to be cautious about generalizations, but to a degree in our judicial processes, most of the questions take on the character of, of examination and cross-examination of witnesses, in which the examiner only asks a question in a way that affirms the client's position. Typically, law students studying how to become prosecutors or defenders in court will learn that cross-examination should tell your client's story even when it is being elicited from an opposing witness. It is not seeking new information, but reinforcing your client's position. In mediation, the central thrust of the questions that mediators ask is curiosity. Mediators are inquisitive, and one of the ways to ask such questions is illustrated by the words of the poem by Rudyard Kipling. I keep six honest serving men, they taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. Rudyard Kipling was a journalist and it's thought that this poem was maybe about the tools of his trade. But other suggestions are that it was about the inquisitiveness of his daughter, Josephine. Maybe the lesson we might take out of this is that a child's approach to asking questions is what we need at this stage in mediation. We will now join the mediators in the land agent's room as they open up the discussion between Tom and Mark. It's lovely to see you both, Mark and Tom. Thank you very much for agreeing to meet with Lindsay and myself. Um, the, the, the reason for this conversation that we're going to have between the two of you is that in the opening session, the, the improvements that were mentioned a couple of times, the schedule of improvements is mentioned a couple of times, and we understand that you may have had a conversation between the two of you as to what, what view were you both taking as to the, land, the improvements that, that are there, and um, we would like to be a party to that. We'd like to listen in on that conversation. So really it's over to you, Mark, and to Tom um, to have that conversation. Is that, is, that, is that fair enough? Is that all right? Yep. So yeah. I'm going to leave the, you to have that conversation. Okay. Um, Good. Well, Tom, um, we caught up last week, but I think it's fair to say we are probably in agreement on the majority of the schedule. And I suppose for the person of the mediators, should, should we just recap where we do have agreement? That would be helpful. Um, yeah. So far as I'm concerned, Tom, I think we're agreed on the farmhouse. 
Yeah, the farmhouse there, there's the schedule that we've got, uh, yeah. so the win windows, kitchen, electric, the yeah. biomass, which you clar we clarified the other day was domestic, um, yeah. and the wood burning in the living room. Yeah. Um, the, the both cottages, I think, um, we're okay to accept for yeah. the same reasons. Likewise, we are okay to accept the land improvements. I think where we do have a real difficulty is over your claim for the both the potato store and the grain store. The lease says that the farm is a mixed arable and stock farm and specifically not for dairying or for vegetable growing and that in particular there's a reservation in that there's no irrigation permitted. Mm. So you know that that does that does cause us a real difficulty. Um, it, it further causes us real difficulty because if, if this is to be accepted, your client will have committed our client to um, potentially quite a considerable tenants improvement claim relating to these, these two items, which in our, our view are invalid under the lease. Now, I should have said, before you, before you come in, Tom, can I just say this is a confidential conversation that you're going to have. Um, thank you very much for setting that so clearly, Mark. Tom, would you like to say something in response to that? Yeah, I think um, on the schedule there, things are broken down a bit further. Um, yeah. I think probably, Mark, it would be sensible to deal with the simpler element of the two being the grain store, which it is let as an arable farm, uh, arable and stock farm. So therefore, you know, it would be a reasonable expectation for a grain store to be there. And it is a good building, but the grain store, I think, is, is, is a reasonable expectation. Um, the one that you mentioned you're not in agreement with, and I am aware that I've discussed this briefly with Hamish, and there is a you can say, a legal argument on this, um, which I'll allow him to add further bones to. But as a point, though, I think it's been well recognised that potatoes have been grown on this farm for a number of years throughout uh, both George's tenure and indeed his father's. So whilst the lease says that, there's been something different, different happening in the place. And furthermore, um, it is a potato growing area. Um, you know, we're talking a nine hundred acre farm, and so therefore, a hypothetical... Tom, Tom, you, you, you can't have it both ways. You, get, you can't pay a livestock rent and, um, and have a um, potato store. And if, if you want to have a potato store, then you can pay a potato rent. Well, but the potato yeah, store has been done by the tenant, and it's actually that would be looked at what the hypothetical yeah, but, uh, cropping yeah, of the farm was. This is this is this is a this is a um, in the lease. This is a mixed arable stock farm um, with with a bar on irrigation. It is it is not a potato farm. Okay, and, and you're, you're you're well aware of this. Okay, so it's how much? So going back to the original point, there, you know, was breaking these down. Um, you know, looking at the grain store itself, do you feel that is a, a point that would be acceptable? Well, I think we need to look at this. We need to look at this in the round. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I think we, we need to sort out this potato store. Our, our position at the moment is is that we're not going to accept the potato store. Period. Well, actually, hang on. Can I just ask a question here? What we're looking at specifically is the amnesty agreement here. And I think where you're coming to slightly mark, if I may, is that you're looking at a check that you might have to write. Now, there's, the monetary thing shouldn't come into the amnesty discussion because it's to do with what is there and what is character appropriate for the holding. And we're encouraged to do this by the TFC, by discussion, which we're trying to do. But as, as you know, this is not just about a tenant's amnesty. This, this is about a whole collection of um, relate related issues so whilst whilst you say um quite rightly that the amnesty is simply about accepting the improvements rather than the values at the end of the day value will come into it because we're, we're, we're here we're here mediating about a an end of tenure position so okay. um you know i think our our, our position is um that we, you know I, I i can't advise my client to accept the potato store, I think I can probably get him to accept the grain store and mm. um, poss possibly the grain dryer. But, but at the moment, it, 
you know, you, you, you've committed, you've committed our client, you know, dis despite what you say, to having to write out a thumping great big check over which he's had absolutely no control over. Well, that's probably a little bit extreme because he, he, you know, your client's father was well and truly aware of what was there and what the farming practice was on the holding. Why, why didn't your client follow the procedure? Why didn't your client serve an improvement notice at the time? What would, what would be the procedure, Mark? To, 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 to serve an improvement notice, which would, which would allow our client the ability to... to say no to it. I, well, I would say no or say yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, to, to object and, you know... Mark, I, 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 will, I will check this out, but I think the situation we've got here is a classic, long-standing, close family relationship with the previous generations. And there was, you know, the amount of improvements that have been done, which there was no notice of civil, okay, you can argue that it's incorrect, but there's an awful, an awful lot of things there, you know, right, you crack on, you know, a great relationship, um, and they, the way the parties have worked in the past, albeit it wasn't correct in terms of notices, but that's fairly common throughout yeah. the country. And, and, and for that, that's why we've taken a fair and reasonable approach on, on all the other items of improvements on your schedule. Okay, which for, is... for, 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 for that for that very reason okay. um, um, we, don't, we don't have we don't have an issue I think you know our, our issue is the potato store right okay so it would be helpful to get some idea of what what value you're actually talking about in relation to the potato store and actually it's fair to say the figure that we probably disagreed to agree on yeah. um, or agreed to disagree on in the way um, yeah. was 150,000 what, what what's the overall um, figure for the whole of the improvement schedule so the figures that where we got to was a global sum excluding those three items i think was 332,000 yeah, i got 322,000 322, but, what, but what's 10 between friends <laughs> but so 322 to 332,000 yeah. yeah. let's call okay. it let's call it 330 for <laughs> would make it easier yeah, yeah. okay okay <laughs> That's really helpful. Okay, well, thank you both very much for this conversation. Can I suggest that you both go back and speak with your respective um, your lawyers and the, the party as well? And um, that would be helpful to get some, some understanding of where you're coming from. So let me interrupt uh, the video as we move from the land agent's room to the solicitor's room. As an opportunity for reflection, I would like to draw your attention to how little the mediators have intervened at this stage. They set the discussion between the parties' advisors in motion by a very open question and let them develop the conversation with just a few quizzical questions along the way. A similar approach now continues in the solicitor's room, but notice how the character of the conversation between the solicitors changes as it moves from a potential debate on the legal issues to do with the amnesty procedure, to thinking through what other possibilities might look like on a without prejudice basis. So we now see the mediation moving from a debate about rights and wrongs to exploring options for bridging the wide gap between the parties. However, at this stage, the focus of attention still appears to be how do the parties find a compromise within the range of the positions they set in the opening statements, or in a less formal way, they are still looking to work out ways to divide the existing pie. So we now join the meeting as Lindsay opens up a conversation between Heather and Hamish. Hamish and Heather, Pamela and I are here to um, help the conversation if we need to, but really to listen to what you are um, are discussing at the moment in terms of the the legal um, the legal issues and how uh, the differences can be resolved. Perhaps I could begin then by saying that the the, the legal issues in respect of the end of the limited partnership tenancy are really quite clear cut. A notice has been served. A counter notice will be served. Um, my client will be able to remain in occupation until 28th of May 2024, unless some other sort of deal is um, agreed between the parties. Uh, the current offers between the parties are quite far apart 
to say the least. However, the fact that we're having a mediation does suggest that there is a compromise to be reached, which involves both sides and moving on their positions. And to a certain extent, all of that isn't really a legal issue to be sorted. That's a, a negotiation between the, the clients to see what they, they might or might not be able to achieve after understanding respective positions. I think that the real legal question which is outstanding between the parties has to do with the amnesty procedure and looking at the amnesty procedure it does appear that Tom Oates and Mark Fogden have been able to agree, agree quite a lot of the amnesty schedule. In fact the, the vast bulk of it except perhaps for the most expensive item which might not actually be a surprise I suppose uh, and that's the potato shed. Um, and I think that that would be a legal issue which would be worthwhile, Heather and I, spending time um, on and discussing between us. Heather? Yes, um, we certainly could discuss the potato shed, but your client was very clear that he was willing to be flexible and that was certainly welcomed by my client. And I don't have instructions at the moment to change my offer, but I wonder if it might be worth having a strictly without prejudice consideration of what some of those other terms might look like. Well, I think George was indicating that he was prepared to be very flexible about solutions which would allow he and Megan to remain farming in some capacity at Pit Lochie. And we could explore a wide range of possibilities to achieve that from a further fixed duration tenancy of some sort at an agreed length. Um, but there are other possibilities uh, as well, including contract farming arrangements of one sort or another. Um, there might even be the possibility of some sort of employment re relationship, because although I have the, the the impression that uh, your client might want to have some sort of in-hand farming operation. As far as I'm aware, he has no previous experience or skills. Um, and uh, the, the Smith family are the people who are ideally placed uh, to provide those skills and experience. But essentially, George and Megan are now focused on a solution which allows them to stay at, Pilo at Pitlochie and for longer than five years. Would they, for example, consider an initial five-year lease with an agreement to look at matters again in advance of that determination of that lease, perhaps to look at going into some sort of contract farming or other joint venture at that point in time, rather than right away? I think their confidence has been shattered about the future because of the notice to terminate the limited partnership, Heather. Um, obviously, the limited partnership was continuing um, for a year at a time by tacit relocation, um, but it had been in existence since 1995 and then has been brought to a, a shuddering halt. Uh, George and Megan, I think, would lack the confidence that signing up to a five-year agreement now on the basis that there might or might not be a, a future agreement uh, to allow them to continue. I'm not sure that they would have very much confidence in that as an outcome, and it doesn't really uh, move them forward at all from your original proposal of entering into a five-year short limited duration tenancy. I suppose it does give time for if your clients were minded to permit uh, early renunciation of the farmhouse, then our respective clients would, could be neighbours um, because they don't currently know each other. The current generation, Megan and Sean, don't know each other. So to enter into a some sort of joint enterprise to farm this land right away might be less appealing than to um, 
continue what is there at the moment, but with more of a hands-on relationship. The Smith family are a very well known um, the quality of their farming operation is very well known to your clients mm. uh, and therefore the, the there's no reason why your clients shouldn't have confidence um, about the the Smith's ability in whatever capacity to, to continue to to work productively at Pitlochy. I don't think it's so much your your clients it's um, my own clients um, role in the future and how that might work alongside the Smith family and the fact that um, Megan is quite although she's obviously been brought up on a farm she's just starting out really so Sean and Megan are, are both really just starting out and it's what role George might play in that how much longer he wants to farm for can I, can I ask can I ask um, something obviously there's there's two components to this um, there's there's the farmhouse and there's the land and for your clients um, I do understand that they uh, particularly Sean's wife is really keen that the farmhouse will be their home uh, which do you get a, a sense of which is more um, uh, important in the short term for for um, the well, that's what I'm really getting at. Again, speaking without instructions, I'm envisaging that the farmhouse is the short term aspiration, and farming is more of a medium to longer term aspiration. But also the legal certainty of being able to terminate um, what is a relatively secure agricultural lease is is important and Hamish will understand that. I mean Hamish I heard I heard from you um, that uh, it's about the long t the, the looking back the history is that there was a very good relationship between the two um, families but that trust has broken down and, and would need to be rebuilt um, but is there something in what Heather is suggesting that could be worked on? Well, so far as the farm is concerned, the, what the, the Smith family, father and daughter, are looking for is uh, a longer term commitment by the um, Bellway family uh, with regard to George and Megan's continued occupation. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand your point, Heather, about certainty on the part of the landlord because any period of limited duration tenancy or modern limited duration tenancy will give your client the certainty of being able to recover vacant possession uh, at, the, at the end. Um, and the other possibility, I, I suppose, might even be the grant of a, a tenancy in favour of, of Megan as a new entrant um, where the, there are statutory breaks if Megan's not demonstrating that she's able to farm properly. I suppose there's the certainty on the legal side, but there's also the um, expectation and certainty and the PR fallout if the same family are in occupation for multiple generations in different fixed term arrangements, whereas a shorter term arrangement is more appealing. But that's where your clients are at the moment, Heather. And uh, if that is their attitude, all that this mediation is doing uh, is dressing up the fact that uh, they want the Smiths out. Uh, and why would we be engaging in the mediation at all if, if that's the case? I don't think it's fair to say that they just want the Smiths out. I think there's um, a lot of empathy for the Smiths situation um, but it's trying to find a solution that protects the landlord's asset um, takes account of what the Smiths want to achieve and what the landlord wants to achieve so when so 35 years is not acceptable five years doesn't seem to be acceptable is there another term that I mean, the next obvious, well, you can only have a, a modern limited duration tenancy for a minimum of 10 years. Yeah. Um, and if we were looking at a, 
a fixed duration tenancy, then I think my view would be that the 10 years would not be long enough. Um, I, I can certainly see my client compromising on the 35 year period, but I think there would need to be longer than 10 years. What if it was 10 years with uh, an agreement, either George or it would be Megan by then, um, would be given right of first refusal to be the contractor? I think George had already flagged up that uh, he would be prepared to consider any sort of um, uh, arrangement. So I, I can see that that proposal would have legs uh, if your client were to make it. Um, a concern might be um, what happened or how long the, the contracting uh, arrangement is, is entered into. Mm -hmm. But um, that, as a, as a, as a proposal, uh, without fleshing out the detail, um, that is something that might, might be worked with, Heather. Is there just something that you could take back to your, um, to your clients? Well, I, I would like to discuss with my client uh, Heather's proposal. Um, if only in principle, rather than looking at the <coughs> particular durations involved. Yeah. But um, it, it is, it is a, a novel proposal that would be worthwhile considering. And if we were to do something like that, um, what do you think we might do about the improvements? Would it be feasible, do you think, to roll them to the end of that tenancy? Well, the, the, it would be possible contractually to roll the improvements forward. Um, one would expect that to be reflected in the rental value that uh, would be charged for the farm um, because those improvements, however we arrange it, would be regarded as belonging to the tenant. And going back to where we started with the potato shed, would your clients be looking to... Um, change the terms of the lease so that potatoes were consented to? Well, this is, there is a legal issue there um, on which I suspect we differ quite strongly, Heather. Um, I appreciate that uh, you will be relying on the prohibition against um, vegetable um, growing w within the lease. Uh, yes. But there's also the, the, the question of the farm being let as an arable uh, and livestock unit and that uh, potatoes in a standard arable rotation um, is characteristic of the, the, the district uh, and the building is certainly uh, character appropriate for the, the holding. Well, a lot of information has now been unpacked in those two meetings. Um, the, the meetings with both sets of advisors has finished and they're going to return to discuss possible ways to move forward with their respective clients. We don't see what they say in the privacy of their private rooms, but in the third video of the day, we will be joining the mediators who are meeting with each of the parties to take stock of where they feel they are at this point. But just now, before we do that, we're taking the opportunity to speak with Heather about her thoughts on the discussion she had with Hamish. Well, welcome, Heather. Thank you for Morning. coming. And I was interested in the way that discussion with Hamish went. Uh, Hamish, having said that the legal issues were clear, went on to identify one, the amnesty procedure, as meriting some uh, discussion. In responding, you said it was something that could be discussed and then asked the question, would it be worth discussing what other terms might look like? The reason I find this interesting is that in that one move, you changed the dialogue from talking about law to talking about things of a business and family nature in a without prejudice way. I wonder what your thinking was at this point in making that move. And secondly, if you had carried on to discuss the amnesty legal issues, as Hamish had proposed, are there risks for lawyers in disclosing the cards that they may be wanting to play close to their chess, just in case the dispute ends up in the land court? Well, there's quite a few questions there, Robin. I'll attempt to go through them. So the without prejudice uh, discussions lawyers have all the time 
Hamish and I have had these sort of debates over the telephone on many an occasion. The great advantage in doing it within a mediation process is that you are completely protected by the without prejudice nature, the confidential nature of the mediation process. So you cannot reveal anything in the land court uh, that is discussed in that separate process, nor would you want to, and nor would the land court be particularly interested in it, because what we're attempting to do in the mediation is get to an interest-based outcome. We're trying to deal with a number of different issues in the one place, whereas if we were in the land court, we'd potentially have two or three different litigations about distinct legal points. I think the, the point that uh, both the land agents and the lawyers are not in agreement with here is the status of the potato shed and whether it qualifies as an improvement. Um, and I suppose what I'm trying to get to here is, does that matter? If we can get to a resolution on the key terms, then suddenly that doesn't seem like such a big issue, or hopefully that won't seem like such a big issue. Um, whilst at the same time, respecting the fact that we have different legal um, opinions on behalf of our respective clients. And I think within a mediation, it's really useful for professionals to, to air those disagreements privately um, between each other without their clients there, since it shows the strength and weakness of your respective positions, which even if your mediation doesn't result in a settlement, can be really useful for when you do end up in the land court. That's very useful, that's helpful information. Uh, it does really seem that the potato shed is the sort of elephant in the room. So I think we're going to have to maybe coin a new phrase, maybe the potato shed in the room. <laughs> for our discussions. Um, but I think that, that's, a, that's a helpful synopsis. And thank you very much for, for joining me, Heather. Thank you. We'll shortly be moving to the last of the three videos of the first day of the mediation. And before we do, I would like to tell you some reflections on mediator characteristics or traits to work in the midst of conflict. I'm calling this my AEIOU of mediator characteristics. And for now, I will tell you about the A, the E, and the O. A is for ambiguity. No, ambiguity is not a mediator trait. The nature of conflict is messy and complex and holding conflicting ideas in one's head and operating effectively is the skill. And so a mediator needs to be comfortable in a climate of ambiguity and uncertainty. A mediator needs to hold a sense of belief in resolution, even when other signals are saying something different. Shedding light, providing clarity, and generally unpacking the complexity so that the mediation process moves from ambiguity to another A, assuredness, is the mark of the mediator trait. E is for empathy. Empathy is taking on someone else's perspective. The habits that help are listening hard and being curious. Listening hard means being in the moment with the other, understanding their feelings and remaining objective and listening with equal understanding to the other party. Being curious is not the courtroom lawyers questioning, but is being an interested and sympathetic inquirer. In short, mediators step into the shoes of each party in turn. And O is for oneself, that is being oneself. Words like being centered or grounded are often used to describe this abstract quality of authenticity. In a short time, a mediator needs to build trust with the parties, people who may have deep personal distrust of each other. The mediating way to effectiveness is not through the forcefulness of debate or the authority of a profession, but rather from the genuineness of our curiosity and the authenticity of the behaviors we model. I will return to this to tell you about I and you in the second part of the mediation tomorrow. Following the mediator sessions with the advisors, Sean Belway and George Smith have had meetings in private with them. And this has been to learn what has been discussed in those sessions and consider how they might adjust their positions in order to find a way forward. 
The mediators have decided to meet the parties in private session to gain an understanding of where each party feels they are at and what gap needs to be bridged. It is also an opportunity for the mediators to find out about any new options for moving towards a resolution of the dispute. We will first move into the landlord's room where Pamela is inviting the landlord team to say how they think things now stand. Pamela gradually works through the different topics that are within the framework of the dispute to clarify the position of the landlord and his advisors. So I was just saying it would be helpful for us to know what you have been able to agree on um, and also what were the outstanding issues that remain. Who would like to speak from this room? Is it you, Heather? I'm looking to you. Perhaps I could start and then Mark could yeah, add come comment. in as well. That's great. So we're at quite an interesting stage where mm -hmm. um, Sean had kindly agreed that I could test out some ideas in my discussion with Hamish Lean, but without committing him to anything. Mm -hmm. Um, you didn't. You didn't commit to and, anything. And so what I was really instructed to try and find out was obviously five years is unacceptable. 35 years is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. What might be acceptable in the middle? And, and Sean really feels that anything more than 10 years is totally unacceptable to him. And even 10 years is quite a stretch. Um, so I wondered if if the parties were to agree a 10-year lease, whether the, um, the tenant family could be offered a right of first refusal to be the contractor yeah. if the yeah. landlord then went into a contracting arrangement in years 11 and so forth. Which Hamish seemed to think was quite, quite interesting. He seemed to be interested in the idea. Yeah. I don't want to get Sean's hopes up, but no, Sean... Exactly. Sean also thought, you know, he could work with something like that. Would There's that make sense for you, Sean? Would that, would that work for you? There is definitely a, a kernel of an idea of a sort of um, yeah. getting from A to B and the possibility of a, of a future arrangement. Um, but as, as Heather has, has rightly said, um, going beyond that initial period, getting too long, is, is not something I'd feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. but the dialogue is something that's definitely worth teasing out and then there's quite a lot of detail within that I so know. the most important detail perhaps for the short term is that sean and his family move into the farmhouse in may 2021 uh, the smiths would live in the two cottages, the cottages yes. one of them. so that's very important and then um the improvements which mark will come on to discuss um i think in principle hamish is agreeable with the idea that they would be postponed until the end of the 10-year lease um, but he mentioned something about that affecting the rent which Sean's not obviously not very keen on that idea of it being a very low rent but we need to see exactly what their proposals are in that regard and yeah, then yeah. that probably ties on Mark to what you think about um, this potato store which seems to be a real um, issue um, yeah. is ultimately whether that's accepted as part of the mix of a negotiation or whether we we hold firm on that one mm -hmm. well i think i think at the moment we hold we we are holding firm on it I and mean, i think where where we where we started off with i mean we've made good progress on on the schedule and yeah we you have agreed to disagree on the grain store and the potato store i think depending on where we end up on the potato store um, I think we recognise that there is value in the grain store. So I think I'd be happy to recommend to Sean that the grain store is accepted as a as an improvement. Mm -hmm. But you know, whilst we whilst we accept the um, the notion of a tenants' amnesty is to record the improvement, what we're actually doing is is committing Sean to a thumping great big. Um, mm. potential compensation claim which is absolutely not of his making and the lease is quite clear um, there's a bar on irrigation there's a bar on vegetables etc so I, I think we we, we hold we hold our position on that at the moment is is where I am 
So you take out the hundred and fifty thousand for the potato store. I think we store. I think we'd take out we take out the hundred and fifty thousand for the potato store. Mm -hmm. I mean, Heather has said that we're rolling um, the improvements in potentially one decision would be to roll the improvements into the um, in, into a new lease. I yeah. think if we get, if we're going to get possession of a farmhouse, then I think we would we would make the improvement payment on the farmhouse now on on possession. Mm -hmm. But if everything okay. else would probably get rolled over. W would you? Is that a fair summary, Sean? I think that's a very, very fair summary. I mean, certainly, if something like the farmhouse is coming out of the lease, then it would seem to me to be perfectly fair and equitable yeah. to pay the compensation for that. Okay. So. so can I just be very clear about what, what you actually are, are suggesting here? You're talking about moving into the farmhouse in May 2021, yes. and you would pay the, the, the improvements at that stage. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. But any other improvements that were agreed upon would be rolled on to the end of the lease. Yes. Yeah. Okay. With, with the exception of the potato store. With the exception of the potato store, exactly, which is one hundred and fifty thousand from the three hundred thirty, which gives you one hundred and eighty thousand. Is that well, is that right, Pamela? Yeah. The the improvements will yeah. be valued at the end of the lease. Right. So although there's values put against the items at the moment, that's the value they would be now. Yeah. They may well yeah. depreciate over ten years. Yeah. Exactly so. So 180,000 would be the most you would ever be asked to pay, is what you're saying? Yes. If to be valued, less than that. Yeah. If valued today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And you're, you're suggesting that the, 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 two, the Smiths move into the two cottages as opposed to the farmhouse where they're living at the moment. Well, George is living at the moment, one assumes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is what we're proposing. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I think, Mark, we might need to look at rent. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly if you're because talking about it being a potato farm. We should put some sort of rent proposal. If we're putting a proposal, we, we, should, we should put all the detail into it. So do you want to leave that at the moment? Do you, do you want us to go no, and have that conversation not. with the, the tenant um, side of things? But we'll come back to you before we, we make any proposal to the other side, if that's acceptable. As we, or as the mediators uh, move between the rooms, let me briefly interrupt. When we move into the tenants room, you will see Lindsay exploring with George and his team where they are at. While the objective is the same, that's seeking to establish clarity about the position that the two parties have reached in adjusting their opening positions and what options there may be for day two. It is interesting to note that Lindsay has a different style of asking questions. For me, it's not about whether one style is, style is more effective, but to be effective, the style of the mediator has to be oneself, as described by the O in my AEIO view of mediator characteristics. We will now join George and his team as Lindsay opens the meeting with a favorite mediator opening move. George, how are you feeling about things now? It is one of the most open questions that we can ask, and it is out there to learn what is most important to George at this point. Listen carefully to George's answer. A mix of optimism for the direction of travel, but he continues to voice puzzlement about Sean's ambitions. And the second part of George's answer is a clue to how the mediators organize the meetings on day two. George, Hamish and Tom, um, how are things going in, in uh, this virtual room of yours? Um, how are you feeling about things? George, uh, how are you feeling about uh, how things are, are going just now? Um, well, from speaking to Tom and Hamish, who've, who've had some negotiations with their counterparts, mm. um, it seems that there are, are avenues that are, you know, would have legs and, and w would be worth look, looking at. Um, personally, I'm still not clear what the Bellway family want out of it at the end of the day in terms of wh whether they're looking at farming it all themselves in 10, 20 years time or, or using a ten tenant or a contract contractors to, to farm it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm wondering whether there's, there are other um, influences on um, what their decision might be in terms of taxation um, and maybe that's a bit 
complicated to go into into now um but i'm wondering what their motivation is to try and reduce the length of of leases or, or reduce long-term commitments but certainly there are avenues that i think are worth looking at well let's think about the avenues that are worth looking at and just see where we can get some um and i, I think there is common ground between you i think there's there's uh, there's optimism for progress um, without getting everything sorted out right now. But um, Hamish, do you want to come in at this point? Yes. Um, during our discussion, Heather offered uh, an interesting suggestion as a, a way of making possible progress, uh, albeit it was without client instructions. And that was the idea of a modern limited duration tenancy of 10 years um, with the landlord uh, if the landlord chose not to continue the tenancy in some fashion uh, and to contract farm the farm that George and Megan would have first option of taking up the contract farming arrangement. Uh, and in discussion with George, um, he thought that that might be a, a suggestion that was worth exploring in more detail. Um, so to that extent, Heather and I's uh, discussion uh, was productive if our clients in fact want to uh, themselves explore that further because Heather was speaking without instruction mm -hmm. and I think um, given Tom's summary of his discussion with Mark and Tom will be able to say something about that himself mm -hmm. um, there seems to be continuing progress with the tenants amnesty schedule uh, although the tatty shed is still something of a, an obstacle to, to reaching agreement Okay, Tom, do you want to just come in here? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty fair enough. The, the potato store there, it, it realistically is probably the big ticket item. There are various options that we could do with these improvements um, just to try and move away slightly from the, from, the, from the pound signs, which I think is causing a big, big blocker mm. um, here and now. Because reading between the lines, it looks like that, that um, Sean went down and served this notice and kickstart the thing without realizing some of the financial implications that were looming pretty sharp at him um, and that in itself may assist in, in smoothing forward to allow George to continue a bit longer possibly not incurring Sean with writing a big check here and now. There's something in there and I, this is way beyond my <laughs> expertise um, about whether you farm potatoes at all and whether potatoes are part of a crop rotation or whether they're vegetables am i right in saying that that clearly is an issue <laughs> well that 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 that, 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 that is the issue uh, i think that the other side are taking the view that because the lease prohibits um vegetable production or vegetable growing that that means that the potato shed which was put up to support potato growing on the farm cannot be the subject of compensation Whereas the counter argument to that is that um, potato production is perfectly common in the area. It's what all of George's neighbours will be doing. Um, it's perfectly standard practice in an arable rotation to, to grow potatoes uh, and that the potato uh, store supports that. And in any event, the potato store has value as a general purpose building. And, and, and so there, there's a, is there a real difference um, among lawyers about whether um, if, if, um, if it's practice in a particular area that potatoes form part of the rotation that actually they should be in, included in the, if I can call it the general lease, is it, and, and then there are others who think that's not the case? I'm just curious about that. But. Uh, yes, um, there is a difference of legal opinion. Um, about that. The other thing which I should have mentioned is that Heather also raised the possibility of the farmhouse being released early yeah. uh, and that was something that uh, George was prepared to, to actively consider as a means to, to getting agreement. It immediately puts into focus what happens with regard to the tenants amnesty improvements to the farmhouse which appear to be the matter of a matter of agreement between Mark and Tom mm -hmm. um, and I understand there's a figure of about £45,000 uh, worth of um, uh, agreed improvements to the farmhouse whether if the farmhouse was going back to the landlord now that sum should also be paid now 
but that's something we've been discussing between ourselves. It's not something that I've actively discussed with Heather. Okay, but but Tom, that that isn't in um, in contention that there's that the improvements in the farmhouse are accepted. Is that right? No, I mean the the. the they, they have been, you know, we, we've discussed them in full, we've agreed them, we've worked through various values and that's where we are, you know, we are we're happy where, where they are at on that, that individual item. Yeah. Yes. Uh, coming back to you, George, though, about the farmhouse, I mean, you you did say right at the outset when we were meeting together um, that you, you would be prepared to leave the farmhouse and, and move into the cottages, is that right? There are cottages? Yes, well, it was... It, it was clear to me at the start of this process that the farmhouse is something that the Bellway farm family wanted to be able to occupy sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So I thought that it was something that we could do a deal around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in terms of time frame for that, um, is, is, do you have a view on, on the when? <laughs> um, it's part Possible, possible within within a year, I would have thought. Yes. And I'm happy to go along with that if you know, providing this a bit of uh, give and take on on my my side. Yeah. yeah. So the um, am I right in 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 terms of just summarising where you're at the MLDT um, of of ten years would be acceptable to you, George, as long as you and Megan, and or Megan, had first refusal, um, these are my words, first refusal an option to contract farm, the, the farm thereafter. Is that, is that where you're at? Largely, yeah, that's a, that's a start. Um, I'm wondering whether that can be strengthened or, or lengthened, but Yes, that's a, a better position than than the default position at the moment. That's one of the key issues that obviously requires more discussion. I'm looking at Hamish particularly there in terms of, of how that can be um, negotiated. It's a, it's a potential negotiation point. Well, yes, of course, uh, that's something that can be uh, discussed with um, Heather, uh, ultimately it comes down to what the, the parties are prepared to uh, agree with each other about the length of occupation. Um, it, we've made it quite clear that five years is not acceptable. The landlord um, has indicated that he's prepared to uh, grant a longer period. Um, the next legal, uh, legally attainable fixed duration tenancy is 10 years. It's got to be a minimum of, t of 10 years. So that's where we, uh, where we are. Uh, but George is indicating that he would like, uh, if possible, a, a little bit longer. What I'm going to suggest is that, that that may be one of, that. well, obviously, is one of the key issues to take forward in terms of, uh, of negotiation and discussion. Um, the other two that I've got down here in my head as headings, one is around the farmhouse and the cottages and where you're going to live. And the other is around the, um, the amnesty schedule and also the, the potato store. These, these are all going to be tied together, I think, in terms of coming to a, a final um, agreement. But it's looking, I feel it's looking promising. Well, we are now at the end of day one of the mediation in which the parties have been building their understanding of each other's position. They're learning about the matters that are important to each other, and they're exploring the potential for adjusting positions to find a path to settlement. The parties are still far apart though. George is looking for more than a 10 year lease and Sean might agree to a first option on contract farming, but not more. Entry to the farmhouse is a gap to be bridged, with George thinking in terms of a year and Sean wanting as soon as possible, but no later than next May. And of course, a big gulf is what I described as the elephant in the room or the, the, the tatty shed in the farm. Um, 
the legal arguments have not been resolved and the land agents are taking diametrically opposite positions on the potato shed, which puts a sum of 150,000 pounds in dispute. So one of the questions is how does that sum, that very large sum of 150,000 pounds become less important in terms of being an obstacle to the settlement. Tomorrow, we will see the participants in the mediation take forward the understanding stage to the negotiating stage, and the parties will speak with each other on the things that matter to each of them, whether these will become obstacles to an agreement or opportunities to build a path to resolution, we will need to wait until tomorrow to see. But now as we draw to a close on this part of the uh, mediation, I would like to welcome back John Robertson, who is going to take this webinar forward at this point. Thank you, Robin. Right, before we um, do move on to the Q&A session, we have the results of that poll that Robin um, raised earlier. So what do you think the outcome of the mediation will be? Um, very few of you thought that um, there would be no settlement. 44% uh, thought something else, so the majority thought something else. Uh, there were some very interesting um, suggestions as to what that something else may be that came through on the, the chat. Um, the majority perhaps were thinking of some sort of contracting arrangement. Uh, there was also quite a lot of discussion about um, uh, the cottages and the house and how they would be um, part of a mix and a settlement. So I thought that seeing that um, we've heard a lot more of the um, mediation uh, and um, the particularly the last sessions where we heard um, some moves towards suggestions as to um, a, a final arrangement, we would run the same poll again. If you'd like to vote again and we'll see whether the participants um, have changed your minds as to where we're going to end up. So moving on to the Q&A while you're doing that, we've got a panel today of um, Robin, Pamela, Lindsay, Heather and Hamish. And there's quite a few questions for them. I thought I would maybe start with one for Heather. Uh, Heather, how, how, do you, how much specialist knowledge do you think the legal advisor needs to have when going into a mediation? In an agricultural mediation such as this one, is it necessary to have an agricultural specialism? I think it is important to know the agricultural holdings legislation um, and to understand the legal issues. I, for example, wouldn't attempt a construction law mediation, but I think the position is different for the mediator. I think a good mediator can turn their hand to any dispute, but the professionals involved in that dispute should have perhaps not specialist knowledge, but should have adequate knowledge of the area that they're advising in and should be confident to have the type of debates that you saw this morning that Hamish and I were having. You would need to have a certain level of experience before you'd be able to, or be willing to go into that. Yeah. Thank you. And you, you, you partially answered my second question, which was going to be addressed to Pamela. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> quite all right. So the, the same question to you, Pamela, but from a mediator's viewpoint, do you feel you need to have at least an understanding of the, the law relating to a subject matter of a dispute? I, I don't feel, I, I'm very much in agreement with Heather, I don't feel that I need to have any understanding of the dispute at all, um, because I'm relying very heavily on the solicitors involved and their understanding, so I would work with them very much in the, in the dispute. I don't know if Lindsay's got any other view on it. Yes, I, I feel the same, but but I, th I think we we do pick up quite a lot of yeah. knowledge as we go through. Um, and and pa um, Pamela's talking about mediations where you do have solicitors, you do have advisors there. I mean, sometimes you don't, and you're just working with parties. And um, again, you don't need to be an expert. In fact, I would say sometimes it's a disadvantage I to agree with you. too yeah. much about the, um, the subject matter. Yeah, because you, you then can assume it, that you know how it's going to sort out, how it's going to settle. That, it's that. Going to and also you, you start to just get a little bit too into the issues mm. and you maybe lose your impartiality a bit. So yeah. there's different ways of looking at it. 
Yeah, I think that's interesting. I just wondered if I could come in. I think all of that's, but as in most fields, um, the, there's a language, there's a there's a way of talking, uh, there's shorthand and things like that. Mm. And it is very useful, I suppose, for the mediators uh, to start to learn a bit about the the way that things are described. Um, yeah, uh, I agree with that. Strange terms come in like Wago, uh, which we don't tend to <laughs> in, in, in any other uh, setting other than in farming. And uh, so it's picking that sort of thing up. And I think that can, um, that's something that can happen, I suppose, doing that sort of familiarization stage in the preparation to go into mediation. Thank you. Uh, well, we've seen some um, episodes of um, difficulties with um, remote mediation in the form of um, muting and um, signals failing. Uh, I wonder if I could ask Robin, uh, what are the benefits, if any, and what are the disadvantages of a mediation being held online? Well, I suppose if you'd asked me this a year ago, I would have had some huge scepticism about holding mediations online. I'd done a few, I'd done a number of telephone mediations. I'd done a few Zoom mediations. Sorry, it's not Zoom. Um, Skype. I was meeting, I did, I'd done some Skype ones. The Skype seems to be less stable. And also um, it's very difficult to have the private discussions on Skype. When Zoom became the sort of platform that most mediators are starting to use, we had the breakout rooms as being the way of creating private sessions. And of course, um, what we've seen this morning is the way we can move around in the breakout rooms, we can create as many rooms as we like. So there can be rooms for different types of discussions. Um, and uh, that is a, is a great advantage of using that as the online or that sort of uh, online platform. But you're asking about the comparison between the physical setting and the um, virtual setting. Mm -hmm. I think we can't get away from it, but there are certain things that we learn in communication in the physical setting, and those help us to um, build trust with the parties, to understand the, you know, what's going on, not just in the language, but in the body language that's coming across. And that seeing people from the shoulder up is not going to tell us quite as much. But on the other hand, we start to learn how to use those signals that we can see from the shoulders up. And I think that we get better at doing that the more we use these platforms. But there's another side to it, I think, and that is about organizing things. It is quite a job to get the sort of group of people who have busy yeah. business lives that you've just seen together for the type of mediation that we used to hold, which might be that we fix the day, we'd have it in either a solicitor's office or maybe in a hotel or something like that. Um, we would all have to travel to one place in the morning, be there sharp, have a long day's mediation, make sure that the place that we were having as the venue wasn't going to close at five o'clock because mediations often go on into the evening and into the wee small hours. And all of that sort of um, structure around getting to the place disappears with Zoom. We can do it quickly. But then on the other side, uh, one of the problems with Zoom is it can be tiring. I don't think um, we would ever be thinking of a 16 hour day or a 12 hour day or something like that on Zoom. Um, so we looked at it a different way. We look at, can we schedule sort of half day sessions close together so that we get some continuity and we try to create something uh, which is actually bespoke for uh, an online platform. And I think we're finding the way of doing that uh, pretty well now and getting good feedback from um, the parties and, and, and clients. Thank you, Robin. And moving on, um, and, and one for Hamish, I think. Um, if I may say, Hamish, as a seasoned land court veteran, how interchangeable do you find the skills that you would use in the land court? 
and how easy is it, is it to move from the land court into a mediation? I think a mediation is certainly different to appearing formally in front of the land court. And whilst the knowledge base is exactly the same in terms of knowledge of the law and understanding your party's uh, or your client's position, uh, dealing with mediators, dealing with the other side, even dealing with your own client, it's very different from uh, examining and cross-examining and making submissions to the court. So it is a, it is a very different thing, I think, John, and uh, it's, it's not the same uh, as appearing in court. Yeah. And maybe taking that over to Heather, uh, who also practices in the land court, but perhaps has more, uh, more of our time in mediation. Uh, uh, Robin raised a point that you'd made earlier on when you moved the discussion away from law to try and find a solution. Uh, can you say something more about that skill and that... Um, the difference between the land court in that regard and mediation. I think if I'd done that in the land court, Lord Minkinish would have said, "Is this relevant? <laughs> um, it's 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 just different. Um, you're looking at the interests of the parties and where those interests overlap. And whilst that is predominantly the mediator's role, the legal advisors can." help the parties and the mediators to get there if so instructed to do so. And I think in this one, um, I very much was instructed to do so. I was instructed to go and find out what, what we could settle at between 5 and 35 on the understanding that, well, we knew that the th five years was not acceptable to the other party and 35 years is certainly not acceptable to us. It is quite a leap of faith, though, because you're testing ideas with your opposite number without the security of confirmed instructions um, and without knowing, so it's a bit like being in court in that respect, without knowing what, what's going to come back against you and what you're going to have to argue. So you really have to have the skill of thinking on your feet, which um, is a transferable skill between court work and mediation work. I'd certainly agree with that aspect. And what is very familiar from uh, land court appearances uh, is the discussion during a mediation with the legal advisor on the other side when all sorts of possibilities are being floated about a possible settlement. Uh, in that respect, it's very similar to the sort of discussions which take place before the formal start of a hearing in the court when there's a last gasp uh, effort to try and reach a settlement. Uh, uh, and that can be quite a creative time for producing ideas about settlement. And that experience is very similar to the sort of discussion uh, between legal agents that uh, Heather and I were, were having today. Thank you. Now, there's a, a theme has arisen in some of the questioning um, about how the mediators deal with emotion. Uh, now, everybody acted very nicely throughout this mediation that we've seen so far. There's been no punch-ups yet. Uh, but perhaps I could ask Lindsay, how do you, agree, how do you deal with participants in a mediation uh, who are at loggerheads and barely speaking with each other? Well, I think it's a good point that, that, that this mock mediation um, was relevant, relatively calm in that in that sense we didn't have the anger or the outburst that that you can certainly get um one thing that, that the mediator should be bringing to the party is is a sense of of calm um some of the behavior or the behavior that the mediator is is demonstrating hopefully is going to um just uh, uh lower the temperature of of the dispute um personally i'd i'd <laughs> I, I don't get too um, upset by um, emotion um, <laughs> when it's displayed, uh, and I don't immediately rush to separate parties. Um, I think it's important that parties actually do hear the, um, the feelings that each other has for, for the other. Um, I don't tend to lay down ground rules about playing nicely or anything like that. Uh, but just occasionally, you know, you sort of have to say, look, 
I think that's perhaps a little unhelpful. And of course, there's the usual mediator skills of summarizing and reframing and just moving the um, animated discussion onto something that's a little bit more uh, more level. So there are, there are ways of doing it, but I think your point that today you've seen um, parties and advisors behaving in a particular way. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's, pro it's probably a little lower key than you might, uh, you might find um, in real life. And Pamela, do, do you think that the difference it's lower key is because it's online. Does that make any difference to the party's emotions oh. and engagement in the process? I, I think it makes a difference to their engagement in the process. I think I think when they don't have any skin in the game, so they're just sitting at home, you know, and they could be wearing something very smart in the top half, but not very smart in the mm -hmm. bottom half. Um, you, you don't really know what's going on. So people sometimes mute and sometimes they, they switch off their videos and you don't really know what's going on for them. So I, I think sometimes the lack of engagement in the process can be can be exacerbated by by using Zoom. But I would very much agree with um, with Lindsay about the whole question of emotion. I do think that the parties in this this particular mock mediation were very well behaved, and I don't normally have people that well behaved to be honest. Um, but I do think that um, I think that the mediator is is expected to absorb some of that some of that uh, emotion, and I think that's that's what we would do. Um, and Lindsay has talked about some skills that she would use in that, that, those circumstances, and I would agree with that. So I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's quite an interesting thought. I, I really don't know whether people are more emotional. I think people tend to speak in paragraphs, as I'm doing at the moment, um, so they don't tend to cut in across each other. Um, I don't know that people are, are any more emotional than they used to be uh, face to face. I think they probably are slightly less emotional, but I don't really know, to be honest. Yeah. And, and Robin, um, we've, we've heard there about um, how you calm down um, emotions. Uh, how do you deal with the party that is not participating, is not speaking, is maybe you no know, nervous about participating online or whatever? How do you encourage people to, to participate? I think there's a lot that you can do um, in the private sessions with them, uh, helping them to um, find ways that they can put their arguments across. So I think that um, Pamela said that uh, one of the things are we're, we're multi-partial. This question of neutrality is always one that uh, mediators like to debate. But actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the best possible engagement between the two parties. And what needs to be done is done. So if one of the parties needs to be coached a little in how they can present their case, then I think mediators will help to coach them to do that. The other party is very articulate, uh, fluent, and they don't need that, but they might need something else to help them in there. So I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage very well with each party so that they can do the best possible interaction in the uh, joint meetings. Now moving over to Hamish and Heather again, I, I wonder, we've, we've heard a lot about the transfer, transferability of the skills from the land court to mediation. Um, for, for those listening who may be thinking about participating in mediation, how much experience in mediation do you think you need to be able to advise a client going through the mediation process? Maybe Hamish first. I think it's a question of learning on the job, to be quite honest, John. Um, it's hopefully people who are thinking about mediation who have attended uh, today's session and tomorrow will feel better armed. Um, but there's nothing like um, just doing it to learn the necessary skills and gain the experience. And Heather, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. It's a bit like doing your first court appearance. You've just got to get on with it. Yes, <laughs> good. <laughs> what, what, one question, going back to Robin now. Um, you made a comment about lengthy mediations, and we've heard about 16-hour uh, mediations. Um, do you think that it's actually better, Robin, to have two shorter sessions uh, than to have one enormous uh, all-day event, putting aside the online difficulties of... Um, how long your battery will last in your iPad. But um, 
is it better to have gaps between smaller meetings so that the parties can um, have time to reflect on what's been discussed in the first one rather than being on the go constantly? I think this is, this is one of the uh, questions that um, mediators need to ask themselves again about. I think there was a tendency over the development of mediation in the commercial setting in the last 10, 20 years uh, for it to become a very macho sort of thing. You start at nine o'clock in the morning and you work through until whatever time it takes to get to a conclusion. And there's a danger that in doing that, um, that in the wee small hours of the morning, um, people can feel that they're being coerced into an agreement. I'm sure that no mediator would want to be coercing people into an agreement, but we all have different sort of energy patterns and abilities to engage over these long courses. So I think that there is uh, questions being asked by mediators about our own processes now and about whether the, um, the, the, the learning that we've had from doing shorter Zoom meetings, you know, a couple of mornings being set aside to do them in succession rather than having long days, um, that sort of thing, uh, I think is starting to raise our thinking in different directions. And uh, we might not go back to quite such long sessions as we had before, but there is a benefit in momentum. I think that it, it, it is useful to have some momentum building up in the direction of resolution. And so we don't, I think, want to lose that. We don't want it to become that mediations are sort of fitted in this week and then it might be two or three weeks hence, that sort of thing. So I think there is something about momentum to what people have, are holding in their heads. Um, and uh, the, there's, there's a general benefit of keeping that team, and I'm talking about the team of the two parties, working on getting to a, an end result uh, within yes. a reasonable period of time. Yes, good. Thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question, which I'll put to Pamela and Lindsay, if I, if I may. Uh, we heard uh, earlier on in a discussion you had with Robin uh, about um, co-mediation and mm -hmm. what it was about. It, it is something that until this mock mediation I had not come across before. I think the first thought of someone like myself would be it's going to double the cost. Um, can you say something more about the benefits of co-mediation and um, uh, why parties should expect or wish that rather than a sole mediator? Maybe Pamela first. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't increase the cost at all, uh, John. Um, as Robin was saying, it, it, you pay for the whole mediation, so you would pay for the mediation, and how, the, how they split it up between themselves is, is for them to decide. I don't usually co-mediate. I usually work with an assistant uh, who is somebody who is less experienced than myself, and uh, that, that's the way I normally do it. So I'm going to turn to Lindsay to talk about... Um, co-mediation because you do that more often than I do. Yes and, and my usual co-mediator is, is Robin. <laughs> Funnily <laughs> so enough. We work, as a business. we work as a business and I guess we've known each other a very long time um, but I but but in the um, the last few years I've also been working with with Pamela yeah. as a co-mediator and um, as, as Pamela says it's not about extra extra cost I think that is something to just say that the cost mm. or the price that we yes. offer is the mediation um, and it so happens that for the sort of mediations that we're looking at today uh, the complexity of them I, I, I personally find it very beneficial to have another experienced mediator there to help me um, work through it and, and Robin mentioned you know the old days maybe there were the days coming back sometime of this you know the 16 hour 17 hour mediation and Pamela and I have <laughs> done one of them. had that experience yes, have. <laughs> but but actually to, to to hold the ring as a as the lead mediator with a, a much less experienced mediator for that length of time or to do it yourself for that length of time I think be very very tough I don't I don't think the parties will be getting the best out of, mm -hmm. out of the process yeah, yeah. I do think that the, 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 the co to, to, to do effective co-mediation, you need to know each other well. 
Yes. And that's why um, Lindsay and I and Robin and I work well with each other and they work very well with each other as well. But there's not many other people that I would choose to mediate with, to be honest. Um, so yes. that's why I have very much somebody acting as my assistant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can control what they're doing because <laughs> I'm a bit of a control freak. No, I think actually, yeah. just to let pa Pamela off the hook of being a control freak, I think that's how yeah. I do it too, which is why quite a lot of the mediations I do that are shorter, I do by myself. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Would yeah. you can add something, Robin? Well, the, the, there's the aspect of um, what, what Pam's doing is helping uh, novice mediators to mm. learn the craft. Mm. And, and that's an extremely valuable thing to do, is to provide opportunities for new mediators to get involved in, uh, you know, the full mediations. That's that. Thank you, Robin. That's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> like, like the point that Heather made about um, your first appearance in the land court. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be an awful lot easier to be a co-mediator or a, an assistant mediator yeah. before you became a mediator. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. That's been uh, illuminating, so thank you very much. That's Before we close for today, um, the outcome of that last poll we did. So there's more now thinking that we're going to have agreement on an MLDT. Um, we're still got a very high number thinking there's going to be something else. Well, all I can say is you'll have to wait till tomorrow, the next thrilling instalment. So that's the end of business for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the webinar on the mock mediation will resume tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, so I look forward to joining you all again then. In the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.